Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit. Local 4 News at 5 starts now. Well, some of us may get a break from the rain in the next couple hours, but there's a lot more ahead, and the wind is just getting started with us. Your forecast is next. Nick? A horrifying situation inside of Dooley's in Roseville as a man is shot and killed here tonight from the mother of the victim's seven-year-old daughter and why she is still having a hard time explaining what's happened. But we're going to begin with a damaging report from Detroit's Inspector General. It says the mayor's office did give preferential treatment to a Detroit nonprofit, and that's just the beginning of it. The report released today by the Office of Inspector General also says the mayor's chief of staff, Alexis Wiley, ordered staffers to delete emails related to the city's work with the Make Your Date Foundation. Let's bring in Jason Colthorpe following this with uh, what's in the report and what the mayor has to say about it, Jason. Well, he put it pretty succinctly, guys. He says the city broke no laws or policies despite what this report says. It's really something, though, that this all started with private surveillance video from Bob Carmack in an attempt to embarrass the mayor for showing up at Make Your Date director Dr. Sonia Hassan's home. She directed the nonprofit based at Wayne State that got more than $350,000 in city grants, but no direct funds, although this report states the mayor directed the fundraising to start. The 300 page report makes two key findings. One, Make Your Date was unilaterally selected by the mayor and his staff without a fair and open process. Two, the mayor's chief of staff, Alexis Wiley, ordered certain Office of Development and Grants employees to delete emails pertaining to Make Your Date. The second being more egregious in the eyes of Inspector General Ellen Ha. For someone to direct someone, especially someone from very high up, to direct delete email, it just sends the wrong message about democracy. I do think the uh, deletion of emails uh, it's a bad look, and uh, I wish it hadn't happened. Mayor Mike Duggan told me today by phone, deleting the emails was to simply protect two employees. You had a time uh, a year ago of uh, enormous media scrutiny, uh, and we had two junior staff people who'd done nothing except do their job well, and they were motivated by keeping these two staff people out of that media circus. The report did not look at what motives the mayor may have had to pursue Make Your Date, including any alleged personal relationship with the director, Dr. Sonia Hassan. They concluded there was no conflict of interest, but there's absolutely no finding uh, that uh, Make Your Date has spent any money or that the program was not very successful. There's nothing wrong with the mayor having a, a priority list or uh, launching his initiatives, but it would be a better government if he would do that in a very transparent and open manner. Yeah, I also spoke with the mayor's chief of staff, Alexis Wiley, today. She told me she's built her career on integrity and said, quote, when interviewed by the office of the inspector general, I was truthful and I stand by my statements. Needless to say, I strongly disagree with the OIG findings. And if you'd like to read this full report, you can do so at clickondetroit.com. Now, did the mayor say he's going to make any changes? because of this report? He did say they're going to look at the policies regarding the emails and deleting things, mm -hmm. uh, but this doesn't really have any teeth, this report. Right. And w w what he can do, though, is uh, obviously uh, make sure something like this doesn't happen right. again. Be transparent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right, Jason. Jason. Let's uh, get a quick check of the weather because it looks like a wall of rain is about to move through on 4 Live Radar, and it's uh, far from over. We want to get over to Ben right now. Uh, he's tracking a potential storm threat too, Ben. Yeah, guys, we could be seeing some thunder tonight, but regardless, we're going to be seeing some strong winds, and it's mostly going to be wind-driven rain that we're going to be watching as we get later and later into the evening. So this is just the first batch of showers that's going to pull out of here. This is the back edge of it, so some of us getting a little bit of a break in the short term. There's more of it getting going out here to the west, but again, the winds are going to pick up, especially with this later push that we're going to see closer to about 9, 10 o'clock tonight. And that's just one of the three stories we're tracking. Of course, the rain is going to be heaviest this evening. We'll look at the timing on that. Gusts could be up to 40 miles per hour. That's area wide, but we have special attention that we're going to be paying to the lakeshore. We'll talk about that coming up. And today we hit the 60s, and it may be the last time we see that in October. More on the cold air that's going to hang around for a while in just a few minutes, guys.
Okay, Ben, now to uh, the newest information we're learning about the man who was killed at Dooley's Bar in Roseville. Yeah, this all happened very early yesterday morning after a fight in a bathroom. The victim is 37-year-old Johnny Ozarski, and as Nick Monticelli reports, his family has much more to grieve than just his death. Good evening. I have talked to the victim's family several times today. As you can imagine, they are emotionally distraught over the shooting that happened here at Dooley's in Roseville, but even more so because the victim in this case, Johnny Ozarski, leaves behind a seven year old daughter. New information today about Johnny Ozarski, the man who was shot and killed in a bathroom at Dooley's near 14 Mile and Gratiot in Roseville. This happened very early yesterday morning. Police say there was an argument between two men that turned into a physical fight. Then police say a 21 year old man pulled out a gun and shot 37 year old Johnny Ozarski. Early on, we knew a bar patron held a shooter at gunpoint afterwards, but now we're learning Ozarski was at Dooley's with his brother in law. He is the one who began fighting with the shooter, and he is the one that held that shooter at gunpoint, waiting for police to get there and arrest him. I talked to family and friends today who say Johnny was the kind of guy who wanted to see you smile, sometimes doing random and ridiculous things just for a laugh. And to make matters even worse, Johnny is the father to a seven-year-old little girl. Overcome with emotions, that seven-year-old's mom didn't want to appear on camera, but did say in a Facebook post written to Johnny, I never thought in a million years I would have to tell my seven-year-old baby girl her father's life was taken by a reckless 21 year old kid who had no business having a gun. I can't explain in words what an amazing, loving father you were. Now the suspect in this case, again, that 21 year old we thought was going to be formally charged today. It turns out now that's going to happen tomorrow as he faces a judge for his arraignment. In Roseville, Nick Monticelli, Local 4. Hey, Nick and Johnny's family has set up an online fundraiser to help with funeral expenses and his seven year old daughter. We have a link on our website. Just go to click on Detroit.com. Bombshell reversal in Washington as the U.S. Supreme Court overturns a ruling over gerrymandering in Michigan. Yeah, gerrymandering is a term for when voting districts are drawn in a way that disadvantages another political party. A previous ruling called for dozens of districts in Michigan to be redrawn because the court determined they unfairly aided the GOP. But the Supreme Court now says the issue should be decided on a state level, which means the districts will remain as is for the 2020 election. But following the 2020 census, a randomly selected group of 10 citizens will be in charge of drawing the maps after Proposal 2 passed in the 2018 midterm election. Ahead at six, what this means for both parties heading into the 2020 election cycle and what comes next for the group challenging that ruling. Trump administration starts the week in kind of cleanup mode. The White House trying to explain the president's decision to abandon his plan to host the G7 summit at his resort in Florida, Doral, and his chief of staff's quid pro quo comments last week, which all comes amid growing pressure on our policy in Syria. Alice Barr has the latest from Washington. Alice. Good evening. The White House is making a series of rare retreats under pressure on three fronts. President Trump huddling with his cabinet today in the midst of a triple walkback on Syria, questions over a quid pro quo and the location of the G7 summit, all as House Democrats step up their impeachment inquiry. They're vicious and they stick together. The Republicans have to get tougher and fight. The president's call for backup coming as he faces backlash from both parties for abandoning Kurdish allies in northern Syria. They helped the U.S. fight ISIS and now are begging American troops not to leave them to a violent Turkish assault. We never gave the Kurds a commitment that we'd stay for the next 400 years and protect them. But the president is now bowing to pressure, saying he'll leave a small number of U.S. forces in the region primarily to protect oil fields. One of the president's staunchest allies has become his sharpest critic on Syria. And Senator Lindsey Graham is now not ruling out the possibility of impeachment. Show me something that, that, that is a crime. If you could show me that, you know, Trump actually was engaging in a quid pro quo outside the phone call, that would be very disturbing. 
That interview held before acting White House Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney acknowledged military aid was linked to Ukraine's help in investigating Democrats in the 2016 election, words he's still trying to undo. My language never said quid pro quo. President Trump also won the defense after changing his mind about hosting the G7 summit at his own resort in Miami. I was willing to do it for free. But people didn't like that. They thought I may get some promotional value. I need promotional value so badly. He blamed the media and Democrats, but many Republicans were critical, too, of what appeared to be a high-profile chance to profit off the presidency. Tomorrow is set to be a big day in the impeachment inquiry, with House investigators hearing from the U.S. ambassador who raised alarm about a Ukrainian quid pro quo in text messages with other U.S. diplomats. From the White House, Alice Barr, Local 4. All right, Alice, while Democrats had hoped for a quick probe, by the way, it is proving to be difficult as each witness has provided more leads, apparently, for investigators to chase down. Nothing quick about it so far. The tentative agreement between the UAW and General Motors is now in the hands of striking union members who are voting on the proposed agreement this week. The voting process started over the weekend with ratification meetings to go over the details of the agreement. The tentative agreement includes wage increases, raises, and keeps the Detroit Hamtramck plant open. Workers are still on strike while the voting happens, though. Voting will end Friday. Monster tornado rips through the heart of Texas. Ahead here at 5, an up-close look at how this freak storm left a 17-mile-long path of destruction. Also, the Great Lakes not messing around. New tonight, a major warning that has even the biggest freighters headed to safe harbor. Hank. A surprising move in court as a big battle over the opioid crisis moves forward. We'll reveal what happened in court and what is coming up next.